Welcome back to the channel. Today we have a new car. It's a 2004 Grand Am GT, and that's about all I know about it. It's been sitting at the auction for almost five years. It didn't run when it got there. So let's find out what we're gonna have to do to it. You know the battery's gonna be dead at least. I didn't have any keys, but I stopped at the dealership on the way home and had one made up. Let's see if it works. We'll get down to the shop and do it all there. in the door. Alright, they didn't change the ignition lock. I didn't actually think the battery was going to be good. Hail vents. Somebody's been here before. Nothing like a little bit of lamp cord. Always oh, says quality. Up. Oh, we got a problem there. Milkshake. There goes nothing. Nothing. That's a problem. I suspect the shift cable is frozen. Oh yeah. Yeah, it's not supposed to be bent like that. Now it's in part to see what happens. If she does start, I can tell you she ain't gonna be happy. Tank of gas, no way. Ah, that's better. No gas. We have multiple problems here at least. Put two jumper packs on, hopefully that'll help it spin faster. It has no compression. I'm guessing that's because the lifters are probably empty. So, also the cylinder walls might be washed down. Who knows? So once we get some speed going here with two jumper packs, hopefully it'll build some oil pressure and maybe even start. Uh, even if we do have fuel pressure, a lot of times these injectors when they sit will stick closed. They need a heat cycle for them to unstick themselves. So we're gonna have to run it off carb cleaner. You 
wants to start. It's going to be a two-person job. One to work the throttle in a can, and the other person to crank it. I don't have any friends, so maybe I'd be quick enough if I jump a bunch of throttle in a can down there. Crank it. Runs long enough that I can run out here and keep it going. Okay, experts, here's your chance to show that you have no critical thinking skills and go down to the comments and tell me how I'm destroying this engine by running it with antifreeze and oil. Because I'm sure that this happened just before the car was parked and it was never driven with antifreeze and oil. Any damage that's done is already done. So we're going to see if we can get it running, fill up those lifters, and then we'll worry about changing the oil. Runs. Ish. So I wanted to let it run a little bit longer because I think that last lifter is finally going to quiet down. I think we're going to have a good engine, just need to do intake gaskets. Um, but I won't know until I can run it longer. I was going to put some gas in it, but it just comes right out the bottom. I climbed under there. I can't show you because I can't. I can barely fit under there. You'll never see it. Somebody siphoned the gas out of this thing. The hose is still in the tank, so the filler neck is no longer connected. It doesn't work so well as a Bluetooth, so I'm going to have to go to Scott's Grand Am Emporium and get that piece of hose that goes between the filler neck and the gas tank. Put that in there so I can put some gas in here. And I'm going to need a window regulator because Grand Am. And uh, fill up the tires, put a shift cable in it, and should be able to drive around at least. Maybe even drive it off the trailer instead of pushing it. So let's go take it home and bring it back another day. So here's our siphoning hose. Still wedged in the tank. Now there's a rollover check valve in there. So I'm gonna change the entire tank because that valve is probably no good and it's not repairable or replaceable. So. We're just gonna change the tank. I have an extra one anyway. We'll throw a new fuel pump in there and throw it back in the car. Fun fact, this is the second silver four-door Grand Am GT I have bought from this same auction location that they drain the gas tank on. This time, they siphoned it out with a hose. The last time, they pulled the back seat, drilled a hole through the floor and into the top of the tank and pulled it out with a pump, I guess, but they lost their drill bit in the tank. That was one that I filled up with gas on the way home, and when I got back, it was all over my trailer. And it was splashing out the hole that they drilled in the top. So I learned not to do that anymore. So we disconnected our gas tank, and now it's not held in by anything except for hopes and prayers. And those must be pretty powerful because this tank's not coming out. The little rubber insulators on the top are stuck to the floor. So this is probably the original fuel pump. But since the gauge isn't reading correct, check valve is bad, we're just changing everything. 
Besides, it's a GM. Chances are the fuel pump was going to go bad in about five minutes anyway. We'll stuff our new tank up there with our new fuel pump. Put our strap back up. Let the other side just hang on the exhaust. That's what it's there for, I guess. We'll run our bolts up for our strap. We'll start plugging in all of our fuel lines and vapor lines. Plug in all our wiring harnesses. And we'll put our heat shield back up. Just one push pin and one bolt. And we got one more plug over here. Now we're going to head up front and do our poor man's oil change. We're just going to drop the oil out of the pan, get all that water out of there and whatever is left of the oil. We're not going to change the filter. We just want to kind of flush it out so that we got some fresh oil in there so we can run it just a little bit longer. I have no history on this car, so I got to kind of make it up as I go along. So I don't want to spend any extra money if I don't have to because this engine might be no good. All I know is it definitely had something on the upper end leaking antifreeze into the oil, and that's probably why they stopped driving it and then everything else happened. So I had to take steps to get it running and start off where it was when they dropped it off at the auction five years ago. So it looks to me like, well, they got rid of it because they had any reason oil and didn't want to pay to have it repaired. GM 34s make milkshakes, but McDonald's milkshake machine is always broken. Maybe they should buy a bunch of GM 34s. Time to start adding our ingredients for our milkshake. First we'll add some fresh oil, 5W30 works the best in this particular milkshake machine. Cap back on, we'll add some go-go juice to our milkshake machine out of an unapproved container of course because the safety experts need to get their heart rate up and if using an unapproved container doesn't do it, just know that when I filled this unapproved container it was placed in the bed of my pickup truck with a plastic bed liner and I was lighting off fireworks with the engine running and smoking and not even smoke. So that should really get you guys riled up. I wish I had a video for you. We cycled the key a few times to prime the fuel system. So now we're going to see if we can get it running. If that heat cycle from our carburetor cleaner at least freed up a few injectors. These things will run on about two cylinders. And I think that's about all we have. As it warms up, we'll hopefully get a few more to join us. One by one, they're coming back. So now that it at least idles on its own, it's time to add our second ingredient to our milkshake maker. And it looks like we don't need to add that ingredient. This Grand Dam has the steam engine conversion. Now that it runs, we need to make it move on its own. So we're going to have to pull the interior out. One, to dry it out because the floor is wet from the window being down. And two, because we need to take a lot of the carpeting out just to get to the shift cable. And we have to take the console out. So we're going to pull the whole interior, pull the headrests off the seats to make them easier to handle. We'll unbolt the back of the seats. The seats just lift forward and slide out of the tabs in the front. One bolt the driver's side. This one has a few plugs on the bottom for the power seat track that you can be certain is broken. A coffee cup. License plate frame. That's all we got with this one. our garbage. Unplug our wires. And this seat lifts out just like the other one. Our sill plates off, just a little wiggle and pull. Pull our seat belt out. Cover just 
slides up and you can get to the bolt that's in it. We'll pull our B-pillar trim off. A lot of wiggle and pull to pull this interior apart. Pull the seat belt out of the driver's side. Bolt it through the carpeting, that's how we have to take it off. Pull our B-pillar trim off. Find a good place to grab it. Now we can start pulling our center console out. Pull the radio bezel out. Unplug the cigarette lighter. And unplug our hazard switch and our traction control button. And we'll squeeze it out of here. We're going to try and take it out of park because we haven't figured out it doesn't come out of park. So we're just going to pry the little clip out of the front of our shifter handle. Pull our handle off. Then we can pop the bezel off around the shifter. It just pries up and then pushes on when you go to reinstall it. Pull the little screw out of the front of the console and the hidden ones in the cup holder. Not really hidden, but after pop and debris gets in there, they become camouflaged. A couple of nuts on the back side. We'll spin those off of there. Ratcheting wrench is the easiest to get in there. Pull the screw out of the front of the console on the driver's side. And there's a couple bolts in the back, way down in there, so we're going to have to use our excessively long extension. Those. We'll pull out on the sides to get the little Christmas trees out of there. We'll engage the handbrake and pull the boot up and lift our console off of there. Now we can see our shifter. We can disconnect the interlock cable, pull it out of the bracket, and we get to our shift cable. There's a little metal safety in there. Pop the cable off the shifter and then pull the cable out of the bracket. Now we can unbolt the whole shifter assembly. We need to take this out in order to get the carpeting out. There's a wiring harness that clips into it, so I'll have to pull those off. And there's a light in the bottom of it. We can unbolt the e-brake and our bracket for the back of the console. And now we're ready to pull our carpeting out of here. It's a little dirty. Maybe I'll give it to the cleaning gnome. Stuff the handbrake down in there. Disengage it. It's a little better that way. Square peg round hole, but we're going to make it fit. Try not to rip the little piece that's in front of it. And if you're careful and take your time, you can slip it over there and save it. We did. Looks like our carpeting is full of dehydrated soda and coffee. Just add water for a delicious treat. We're going to fold it all up, stuff it out the door, and we can start pulling our padding off the floor. This back corner is what's really wet from the window being open. So we're just going to go hang it up to dry. Not in the sun, because it will shrink. Now we can pull our front padding out. We need to pull this little vent off that goes over the top of it. And the other half comes over. This side has a wiring harness attached to it, so we'll just kind of leave it in there. We are going to have to disconnect that airbag module before we end up ripping the wiring out of it. Pull the safety off of it. Push a little tab down and it pops out. We'll just leave that harness on the vent. Let it fall in our way. Now we can get to the cable that's attached to the firewall. Pull it out 
of its little brackets. We can disconnect our battery. It's just kind of sitting in there. It's going in the pile. It is no good. Now we can unbolt the bottom of our air box and disconnect our mass airflow sensor and intake air temperature sensor. Pull the boot off the throttle body and we're gonna pull this whole mess out of here. And clip our throttle cables. And now we can see our shift cable. Pull a little safety out of it. Push the tabs in. and slide it out of the bracket. And there's our problem. The shift cable went limp. So the metal cable inside swells up and locks itself into that plastic. So it doesn't move at all. Then when you try to force it, it bends the end of the cable over and it goes limp. So that's where we are now. So now we're gonna pop the cable out of the firewall and pull it out of here. Scott's Grand Am Emporium has these in stock. This is not the first one I've had to change. Now we have our new used one. Start by stuffing it through the firewall. Routing it up along the firewall. Can you see it? The pizza girl's on the other side. She's kind of guiding it up there. Of course she didn't bring me a pizza, but I'll take the help I can get, I guess. Once we feed enough of it through to get along the firewall to the top of the engine, we can just pull it through. Pull it. It always wants to go on like the wrong side of the rack and pinion and heater hoses and everything else. So now we'll clip it into the firewall. And make sure it's sealed in there. Don't want any water getting in. Start clipping our cable into our firewall. Tuck it underneath our throttle cables. Snap into that bracket. And route it down next to where the battery should be. We can clip it into the cable on the trans. Put the thing back in park. Then we can push our cable on. Put our little safety back on there. And now we should be able to shift this thing from inside the car. Moving it around the shop was kind of interesting. So I was hoping we could get away with just doing intake gaskets on this thing. That's what was causing the milkshake. Uh, but it turns out that our overflow bottle is puffing away like the little engine that could. So we're definitely going to have to do head gaskets. Which isn't such a bad thing because even if we did intake gaskets, eventually the head gaskets were probably going to fail. So this way, we're just doing everything. So we'll pull the intake off, we'll see how bad those gaskets are, and then we'll continue on down and pull the heads off. And hopefully we'll find some bad head gaskets and not a cracked head. We won't know until we get into it. Let's get into it. So we have our intakes off, and now we can see inside the engine. It failed in the coolant port opening like it usually does. These have already been replaced one time, and it appears they didn't like their oil changes, so it's pretty nasty in there. This engine does have 167,000 miles on it, and you can see the push rods are pretty rusty because they ran water in this thing for the longest time. And it was definitely cylinder number two. It's always cylinder number two. And if the rust wasn't the clue that this is a cylinder that failed, it's pretty obvious. When you start looking at the cylinders, the clean cylinder is the one that had water in it. That's an old trick from back in the day to get rid of carbon. But the biggest concern of mine is that cam that's had water sitting on it for a long time and the cam is pretty well pitted. I'm not throwing a cam in this thing, so I am gonna throw an engine in it. So Scott's Grand Am Emporium had a nice 110,000 mile engine that just had the intakes and Head gaskets done before they wreck the car, so we put that engine in here. 
and you don't get to see it because I only had a couple hours left in the day and I had to pull an engine out of another car and throw it in this one all in that time. So I didn't have time to record it. I also didn't record putting a brand new radiator in this thing, which is the cause of all of our problems. The radiator started leaking. We ran it out of antifreeze, overheated it. That's probably what helped take out those intake and head gaskets. And then they just kept going from there. The lamp cord that was on there originally was what they used to keep the cooling fans running all the time which probably didn't help because these things cause an air pocket right above the thermostat when there's air in the system and the thing just overheats. If you pull a thermostat out, it might have been a little more effective, but they didn't do that. Now that the engine runs and cooling system works like it should, we can start changing the rest of our broken Grand Am stuff, like our broken window regulator. Got our door panel off, so now we're going to take our time and pull the water barrier down without tearing it into little shreds, hopefully. With little patience, it does come off and sticks right back on. There's a fine line between tearing the glue and tearing the water barrier. And it appears I haven't crossed that line. Now we can tear the front down a little bit we're going to leave the bottom attached because that's the part that really matters. We're just going to pull it down enough that we can get to all of our bolts. We'll lower our window down to where we can unbolt it from the regulator. And we need to power it up. We're going to unbolt our regulator. Unplug it. Pull our window back up and tape it up out of our way. Then we can slide our regulator out of here. Toss that in a pile. We have our new one from Scott's Grand Am Emporium. Drop it in there. A couple of the bolts have slots, so you can leave them in there and then just hang it in place. And put the rest of the bolts in and tighten it up. We'll lower the glass down into the regulator. Line up the holes and bolt it in. Make sure it works. All right. Better put it up and stop using it before it breaks. And stick our water barrier back up here. We can throw our door panel back up there, pull the wiring through, flip it into the window sweep, slide it down in there, and just smash the clips into the door. Put our screw in behind the switches, plug our switches in and snap those in. And then put our bezel around the handle, and one screw in there one under the grab handle, and one behind the reflector. And we can snap the reflector in there. Our carpeting is nice and dry, so we can throw it back in our car. We'll start by putting the padding in. Slide it into place. And slide our rear padding underneath the emergency brake cable. Ductwork back on our floor. Plug in our airbag module and then throw our carpeting in here. The detailing gnome cleaned it, didn't go too crazy with it because you don't see any of it. Pull our seatbelt in, push the cover back over it, then put our B pillar trim up there. Use our B-pillar installation tool and pull the gasket out around it. Snap our sill plates in there. The B-pillar installation tool works for putting those in too. We'll 
head over to the driver's side and put that together. Snap our B-pillar trim in there. The front sill plate tucks behind the hood release. So we'll slide that in and smash the rest of it down. Put our rear one in. It slides underneath the back of that seat first. Put our seat belt back in. Lay that down to manufacture specs. And put the cover down. And we can throw our seats in. I'm not going to put the console in yet because we're going to need to take it out again anyway. Plug our seat in. And bolt it back in the time. Plug in our emergency brake. throw the seat on the passenger side. Get those front tabs in there. Put it all the way forward and get to the bolts in the back. I mean you throw the padding underneath the back seat in. This is actually supposed to go in before the carpeting but every time I put it in there I ended up bunching it all up when I walk over it anyway so I just put it in afterwards and save myself some struggle. Tuck it in underneath the sill plates and then tuck it under the carpet. We're ready to throw our seat in there. Put our seat belts through the notches. Get the right ones in the right place. And then just push the front end in, clip it down. Put our headrest back in, and we'll put the back of our seats in. Slide the outside tab in there, and the middle one just clips in. You just push it down in there, those are spring-loaded. Same thing on the other side. Make sure they're both in there. Grand Ams do have their share of problems. Most of them won't leave you stranded, but every annoying little problem, this one seems to have. So we have a broken wiper transmission, or a manual wiper on the driver's side, however you want to look at it. So we're going to have to pull our wiper trans out of there. Pull the washer hoses and little caps off of our wiper arms, unbolt the wiper arms, and then use the wiper arm removal tool to break them free. Put this one in the down position, Break that one free. Then we'll disconnect the hose on that side. Then we'll pull our little push pins out of our cowl screen. And pull the washer hose out of the mud that's been caked on there. That's from sitting at the auction. That's how long the thing sat there. Now we can see our wiper transmission, so we unbolt it. Just three bolts to hold it in. We'll slide it out of here. And we can flip it over. And now we can see the little tab, so we can unplug it. The connector tab is on the bottom, so it's easier to unplug when it's out of the car and upside down. Now we have our new one from Scott's Grand Name Emporium, who is apparently sponsoring this video. I'm gonna drop it in there. Bolt it in, and then plug it in. Now we can throw our cowl screen back up there. Man, it's clean. Finally, they put in clean parts. Relax, guys, it's the only one. And the cleaning gnome was standing there watching me, so I gave him something to do. We'll tuck our cowl screen underneath the windshield molding. easier when you're putting the windshield in afterwards but it will go in there you just got to take your time and that molding's pretty brittle it's old and been sitting in the sun for a long time put our push pins back in there and then we can put our wiper arms on 
We can just use the dirt lines on the windshield to line them up. These are self-aligning anyway, so I can't get them wrong. I guess you could, but it's gonna take effort. We'll bolt them in, put our caps in, and then we'll check to make sure they work. And our wipers go back and forth, but I don't think you'd call that working. They're pretty old. I think they're due for a replacement. So we'll replace them. check and make sure that these wiper blades don't leave a streaky mess. Hopefully they don't. Much better. Since we didn't get any keys, we didn't get a fob. I had an extra one laying around, so we're going to program it to the car. Pretty easy. Program the fob, it's go to that selection, hit continue, puts it in programming mode. Well, select how many fobs you want. Just press and hold the lock and unlock buttons on the fob. It'll cycle the locks and let us know it's programmed. So now we'll just check our buttons and make sure they work. And now we have a fob to get into our car. And the only thing better than a brake job hammer is a brake job gnome. And the brake job hammer is in the shop for warranty work. So. The brake job gnome put our new pads and rotors all around on our Grand Am. And I had to show you for video proof because otherwise I would get accused of not putting brand new brakes on the car that the people accusing me of will never buy anyway, so it doesn't matter. But it does have brand new brakes. Now we're going to pull our C-pillar trim down. We need to get the package shelf off of here. Somebody stole our speakers out of here. We're going to have to put them back in. And we have some other parts to change while we're here. The other part that we're going to change that we needed the package shelf off for was the deck lid. We're going to change this out because it has hail damage all over it, the paint's peeling, and our spoiler's checking pretty bad. So to fix all that, we're just going to replace it with one that's the right color. Pretty easy. Just pull the wiring harness out of it. Just a brake light and a trunk latch and a couple clips. Now we can unbolt the deck lid. We're going to unbolt it with the hinges still attached to it. Don't really know why, it's not like it's any easier this way. It just doesn't disturb the paint where you can see it because I'm trying to make sure this car is all original. It's gonna be a show car when we're done. Drop the deck lid down, and pull our hinges and everything out. And there's our two deck lids. Quick upgrade, only takes a few minutes. If I wasn't dropping the package shelf, I probably would have just unbolted it from the hinges, but since I was pulling the package shelf out anyway, it made sense. There's a couple of tabs on the hinges that hang on the package shelf, just long enough to give you a false sense of security so that you let go of it and then it falls in and breaks the back glass into a million pieces. So we're going to start a bolt so that doesn't happen. These are also much easier to adjust and align because the adjustments are on the hinges. That's another reason I took it off here. Down. Now we can pull our latch out of here. We need to get the lock out because our keys are different. We can pull the little retainer clip off the lock and probably launch it into the deck lid. Now it came out. That's a first. We have our lock out of our original one. Drop that in there. Smash it in there with our lock installation tool. And we'll put our retainer back in. Still haven't dropped it in the deck lid. It's gonna happen. Flip it in. And we can put our latch back on. 
bolt that in there. And route our wiring harness through there. No need for a fish line on these. They're pretty easy to get in there. This one's getting stuck. Just because I said that. We'll give it a little help with the screwdriver. Once it gets up to the third brake light, you can reach in there. Comes out pretty easy. There it is. And we can just clip the harness into the deck lid, plug in our third brake light and our latch, put the harness back into our hinge, and we're ready to check it out. Try our brand new fob. Electronic release works. And the key works. Wow. So now we're gonna put in our flea market brand speakers. We use the original mounting brackets and just screwed them into that. Then we spliced the plugs from the original speakers onto the back. They left them in there for us. So it makes the installation of the aftermarket speakers pretty much like it was from the factory. Just with speakers that won't blow out after about five minutes. So when those are in there, set our package shelf back in there. Need to get it all the way back in the corner. The window urethane is kind of keeping it from going all the way back. They do tend to glue these things in there, not on purpose, but when the urethane oozes onto it, it basically sticks them in there. So we push it down over the child seat anchors. Now we're ready to put this trim piece on around the opening for the trunk. Get that over the seat latches. Put our little push pins in there. Now we put our C pillar trim back up there, feed the seat belt through it, tuck it behind the seat, and clip it into the C pillar. And Another one of the Grand Am problems reveals itself. The infamous defroster tab that's fallen off the window. We'll have to solder that back up there. As soon as we're done messing with the seat pillar trim. Flip it in there. And head over to the other side and put that seat pillar trim in. And the pizza girl's still hanging out. She loves Grand Ams. Can't keep her away. Actually, she hates these things. So if she's not here for the Grand Dams and didn't bring a pizza, she must be waiting for the tires. Can't keep those CrossFitters away from tires. Put this side in. We'll put the gasket back up there. Put our seats back up. So with all of the junk that was in the radiator and the engine from the stop leak and rust from the water they ran in it. I decided that it's probably a good idea to change the heater core. And I also decided it's probably not a good idea to show you guys that, at least not right here. That's a video all on its own. Links up there and in the description uh, if you want to go watch that video. It's kind of a big process. You've got to pull the dash out, but it is manageable and these dashes come out pretty easy. So go check that out if you're interested in how the dash comes out. Uh, but otherwise, we're going to get back to the rest of our stuff on our Grand Am here. We must be nearing the end of the build. Mr. Spotty finally showed up. We'll pull the closeout panel off. These headlights are pretty foggy, so we're going to go ahead and change them. And our friends in China make them for us so cheap that it's not even worth cleaning them. So we'll pull the little keepers out. Lose them in the Narnia. And then pull the headlights out of here and plug them all. Probably break the tab off with the headlight bulb. And we needed to change a few of these bulbs anyway. I don't think there were any working lights up there, especially not the extra cloudy one. It's like a Christmas ornament. 
pile. And our brand new headlights wouldn't be complete without brand new LED bulbs. And as much as I like how bright LED lights are, what I like about them even more is the halogen peasants really get upset about it. And well, there's nothing they can do about it because they can't afford LED bulbs. If they could, they'd put them in and blind me back. We'll clip all of our brand new bulbs in. Put our light in this side. Snap all of our bulbs in. And those are the LEDs, in case you want to pick up a set. They're pretty good. Same ones that I put in a few of those pickup trucks. We'll tuck our closeout panel back under the bumper and clip it in there. Now we're going to aim our headlights so that we're not blinding people, which is a step that the LED complainers never even imagined was possible. For everyone that's going to complain that I spent a lot of time on a beater car, well, I didn't spend that much time, about eight hours total for everything I did. And I spread it out over a few months. I got it running and then did little parts here and there and drove it in the meantime. Put about a thousand miles on it and had a nice winter beater. As soon as I was done with it, actually before I was done with it, I had people lining up to buy this car. It might not be the fanciest, but it's definitely profitable. And I got it really cheap. So thanks for watching and I'll see you when I find another cheap car to build. I don't ever smoke up, no I don't take I got no love for the fakeness If you wanna play tough and wanna hate this I'll always show up and make a statement I don't ever smoke up, no I don't take